thank you. Uh, before I begin, first I want to thank uh, Avi and Ajay and uh, Josh for this fabulous conference. This is really great. Uh, I feel honored to participate. So thank you guys very much. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, they often say you don't want to be the speaker before lunch because you know people are really hurry uh, in a hurry. You don't want to stand between people at lunch. Here I'm standing between people in an airport. Uh, that's even more nerve wracking. So I'll try to be time efficient. Uh, so this project is called um, Robocalypse Now. Does productivity growth uh, threaten employment? This is joined with uh, Anna Solomons from Utrecht, who's sitting there. And uh, this is actually an in-process uh, paper that we're preparing for the Brookings Review, we'll be presenting there in March. Um, so uh, we know that there's been 200 years of concern about the impact of uh, productivity growth or automation on employment. Uh, you could look to the Luddites, but you could also look to US uh, Secretary of Labor James Davis in 1927, who was making pretty worried noises about automation in steel. Uh, Lyndon J Johnson's Blue Ribbon Commission uh, on Technology, Automation, Economic Progress. The concern there, as many of you recall, is that productivity was growing too fast uh, and that we would run out of jobs because we had such high productivity growth they probably would like to have again. Uh, and of course, Vasily Leontief in 1982, uh, likening workers to horses. And now, we're clearly in a period of, of uh, extremely heightened automation anxiety, more than we've seen in decades. Um, and I think uh, focusing on worrying about jobs really is the right thing to worry about, because employment is not just about income, it's about identity. Uh, it's about the role that people have in, the, in the society, how they see themselves, the social circle, and the esteem that they have. And so employment, uh, you know, in our canonical models, employment is bad. You just exert effort, but you get some consumption at the end of the day, so you're fine. But we recognize for, for most people, uh, employment is a great deal more than that. Um, so from the citizen policymaker, it, uh, the concern is obvious. The more work done by machines, the less work done by people. The lump of labor idea, or you know, in, in folkloric terms, the steam-powered hammer uh, versus the steel-driving man. Right? You remember John Henry. Uh, professional economic opinion has always been a great deal more optimistic than that very simplistic view. Uh, that we have elastic demand, so advancing sectors may expand, as shown in some of the work by Jim Besson, looking at specific historical examples. We have income effects, so rising wealth uh, may create new demands. And of course, we have sectoral reallocation, a point going back to Baumol. Uh, so labor is going to move to lagging sectors. Um, but economists appear to be some, losing some confidence in these long-held theories. Uh, I, you know, I, exhibit A, typically, is the falling labor share of national income. Um, as I emphasized earlier, I don't think that's the, that is necessarily reflective of automation, but still uh, is a worrisome sign. And, but it's not just the falling labor share. Uh, as uh, Eric, and, and, uh, uh, in his you know, extremely articulate book, uh, talked about an age of brilliant machines, computers managing financial portfolios, websites and drones, ro robots leaving the assembly line, presumably coming for all of our jobs. Um, and uh, economists have really taken these ideas so seriously. And, uh, and an emerging understanding makes clear that this is not just uh, science fiction. This really can happen. Uh, machines can directly replace job tasks, uh, even if they complement workers in other tasks. Uh, and there's a growing set of models of labor immiseration. Uh, you can have an intergenerational uh, market failure, as in a work by Jeff Sachs and co-authors. Uh, you could have task encroachment, a work by a paper by Daniel Susskind, just eventually there's no place to hide, there's no place left for labor to go. Uh, tasks may or may not be created endogenously fast enough to replace those are automated. So that's in Asimoglu and Restrepo. That's in the work that Chad was presenting earlier today. Um, the evidence does not yet strongly support this immiseration view. Uh, there's a vast literature that makes clear that computerization has been skill biased. We even have pretty good quasi-experimental evidence of that from Norway. Um, but there's really little overall work on, on how te technological progress affects employment levels. Uh, there's the work by Alexis Poulos and Cohen that, has, uh, that says technological progress is strongly creating, uh, but I was in the you know, 1910s through 1940s. Uh, the work by Gregory, Salmons, and Zirin looks at the kind of both the employment reducing and employment complementing effects across the regions of Europe, finds a, an optimistic story. There's, and then there's work on robots. So the work by Greats and Michaels uh, says that the industry level seems to be positively associated with employment gains. The work by Asimoglu and Restrepo looking across geographic areas of the United States finds negative effects on both uh, employment and on earnings. So this paper is going to ask, in a very broad brush sense, across a number of countries, uh, is recent labor augmenting technological progress eroding employment? Does productivity growth cause advancing industries to grow or to shrink? Do cross-industry spillovers uh, offset or augment these, uh, these own industry effects? Uh, has this relationship changed over time? And um, also, you know, not just about jobs, but the type of jobs, is productivity growth skill-biased 
should be worried about just the quantity of jobs or also the, the set of workers who can fill them. Um, our approach is very straightforward. Uh, uh, we're going to study the impact of productivity growth on employment across 19 countries, 37 years, and 20 industries. So we're going to focus on overall productivity growth as measured by output per worker, value added per worker, or total factor productivity growth. Now, that's a very reduced form measure of productivity, but it's an omnibus measure. It captures anything that makes labor more uh, productive. And so we're going to have to take a stand on which specific technologies, because then we could just be under, you know, we would miss many if we tried to uh, quantify each. Uh, and we're going to look at employment by industry and overall, at final consumption as a check on whether we're measuring productivity, not something else, uh, on skill inputs uh, within industries and skill inputs economy-wide due to induced sectoral shifts. So the big picture, as you're all well aware, is that productivity growth and employment to population rates tend to positively co-vary. Right? Most countries don't go, oh, damn, high productivity, now we're all out of work. Uh, generally, these things are, are moving together. Uh, that's true in uh, big countries. Uh, it's true in smaller countries. Um, but of course, uh, as I've been cautioned by uh, macroeconomist friends, to the degree they're willing to remain my friends, uh, this is not an informative uh, illustration of anything in particular. So we're going to go. <laughs> uh, so that's why we're going to work at a level, uh, a smaller, finer level of aggregation. So we're going to be using the EU CLEMS for 1990-2007, working with 19 developed countries, uh, 28 industries. Uh, we'll be looking at employment and labor productivity. We'll also merge in data from the World Input Output Table to look at uh, the uh, uh, consumption response. And we're adding data from uh, the CLEMS through 2014. We haven't done that yet. That, they use a very different standard, so we have to back propagate that, so to speak, uh, into our earlier data. Okay. So the first question we want to ask is, well, do advancing industries grow or shrink? So the dependent variable here is the change in the log of employment in country C, in uh, industry I, in year T. Uh, we put in some controls, and then the change in labor productivity uh, measured in three different ways, uh, either pure labor productivity, pure output per worker, value added per worker, or TFP. TFP obviously is intellectually the most preferable, but empirically the most suspect. Uh, so uh, that's not the one we focus on the most at present. Um, so what should happen, first of all, as productivity grows, labor productivity grows in industry? Well, in the pure lump of labor world view, we should get in a, a, a coefficient of negative one, right? Uh, if workers become twice as productive, we have half as many of them. Uh, in the kind of demand surge view, uh, that uh, as labor becomes more productive, prices fall, output could rise, you could have rising productivity, as we saw in the early ages of the Industrial Revolution in textiles, in steel and iron, in automotive. Or you could have uh, somewhere in between. You might have a fall in employment in that sector. It may show up somewhere else. That's not the first question we're asking. So the answer is unambiguously, and you know, without any uh, uh, caveats, negative. Rising productivity in industries is associated, is predictive of falling employment levels. So let me just, that's the last regression table you will see uh, today, unless you read a regression on the plane. Um, this shows you pictorially what we find. So these are the point estimates. These are the confidence intervals. So when we estimate these industry-level relationships between employment and labor productivity growth, uh, when we estimate them without fixed effects, with country year fixed effects, with country year times country industry effects, uh, in every possible combination, this is always and resolutely uh, negative. Um, it's clear that if you're in a sector that sees a uh, rise in labor productivity, you should expect to see a uh, falling employment. Um, we were surprised by how that clear that is. But you know, if you step back, uh, like here shows you just across the five major sectors, this is not the level at which our data lives, but just for uh, visualization, uh, mining utilities and construction, education and health, high-tech services, manufacturing low-tech services, what dominates the data is enormous productivity growth in manufacturing and a shrinking share of employment in manufacturing across developed countries. Some of that, of course, has to do with outsourcing and trade, but a lot of that is having to do purely with labor uh, replacing technologies. It's also true, in, we were shocked by this, if you just do this estimate at every single sector in our data, it is absolutely the case. In every one of them, you find uh, rise in labor productivity uh, is predictive of falling employment. That's true if you use raw labor productivity, if you use value-added based labor productivity, or if you use TFP-based productivity growth, although that one actually, interestingly, is a little bit less negative. Um, so uh, one reality check on that you might be concerned is, well, maybe we're just, you know, what's happening actually is not fluctuations in the numerator, but in the denominator. In other words, employment is falling. It's not sort of productivity is growing per se. 
Uh, so we asked, if, if there's rising productivity, uh, then there ought to be a consumption response. We should see more of this output being purchased. And so using the CLEMS, uh, when we look at either raw labor productivity or value added per worker, we do see uh, growth in industry output. Uh, so it's not purely just same output, fewer workers. There is a consumption response, which then suggests immediately there's going to be some type of general, general equilibrium effect, right? That means uh, if output is rising, there's either going to be there's going to be a combination of inter-industry linkages that may boost output elsewhere, as well as uh, demand-side responses that may uh, work through income and change final consumption patterns as well. So that's what we want to look at next. Uh, so we see in the aggregate uninformative picture uh, that productivity growth is associated with rising employment. In the uh, industry level picture, always the opposite. Um, can, is there, you know, can we see that process working out? Uh, as I mentioned, there could be employment spillovers either through final demand or through inter-industry linkages. So we're going to take the same estimating equation and we're just going to throw in, in addition to own productivity growth, we'll le use the leave out productivity growth of all the other industries in your same country in the same year. So this is operating at the level of uh, 18 countries, 20-something uh, industries, uh, 37 years. And the question is, we know that this coefficient is strongly negative. Do we see anything that looks positive here? And the answer is uh, yes. So these show you the direct, the, the own industry effects of labor productivity growth. These show you the uh, outside your own sector effects. We estimate this five different ways. Uh, using gross output, using value added, peak to peak, trough to trough, and TFP. And in general, uh, these are always negative. The spillovers are always positive. The spillover from TFP growth appears to be the largest. So when you do the net effect, it's generally positive, but generally not significant. In other words, it looks pretty much like a wash. In other words, this would suggest that the largest driver of employment growth is not productivity growth. In fact, the largest driver of employment growth, of course, is population growth. Uh, but even holding population constant, this doesn't appear to be entirely first order. Um, now, you could ask two questions about this. One is, does it matter where the productivity of growth occurs? Is all productivity growth equally good for employment? Or does it matter what sector it occurs? And then, of course, the second question you'd want to ask is, is this relationship changing over time? So let me take those one at a time. Uh, does it matter where it occurs? It, it's going to matter uh, for a variety of reasons. One is. Uh, some sectors have larger weight in the economy, so productivity growth in those sectors frees more income. Uh, another is the degree of competition may affect how that plays out into consumer incomes and final demand. Third, it could matter whether demand is saturated, to use Jim Besson's term, right? So further productivity growth in, you know, toilet paper probably doesn't stimulate a lot of additional toilet paper demand. Uh, it probably just reduces employment. Late in the day, but that was still funny. Uh, and... Um, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, I'll, I should have I should have brought the, the laugh cue, uh, and there may, it could even be that international production chains matter here, right? So maybe productivity growth in some sectors leads to a lot of employment demand in other countries. So there are a variety of reasons why this will differ across sectors. Uh, so what we do uh, is we just augment this further. We allow the productivity spillover to be a function of the origin sector. Not, uh, so it could, uh, it can, uh, where, where it occurs is allowed to have different effects on employment in other sectors. So uh, what we find is that the size of both the direct and spillover effects differ by sector. So in all sectors, again, uh, a negative uh, own productivity effect, smaller manufacturing. And then the spillovers appear larger, especially in low-tech services. Now, a, a good reason why that would be true is those are a big chunk of employment. Right? A lot of income uh, goes into healthcare, uh, into, uh, into food services, into hotels, transportation. So uh, that may be the reason why it shows up there. Um, so it, it does, but that, there's a surprisingly positive message there if you, if you take that literally, which is this is a lagging sector. It says if we had a lot of productivity growth in that sector, it would actually generate more employment elsewhere. Like that, that would actually have uh, good external effects. So, uh, so if we add these up and say, well, what do they imply for employment to population? Okay, uh, <laughs> uh, instead of just overall count of jobs. Um, well, the, the implied cumulative effect uh, uh, on, t oh, I say, I see this, okay, but anyway, let me just say, this says, uh, if we look over this 37 year period, um, the, the net effect on overall employment um, adding across sectors is a few percentage points. 
right? So there's a tr in this time interval, there's a very long, there's a very large increase in measured productivity in this 40 year interval. It amounts to, on its own, implying a few percentage points gains in employment. Um, if you compare that to the changes in employment to population that have occurred in the same time period, it's not negligible, but it's not huge, right? The dominant factor, of course, driving changes in employment to population is entry of women into the labor force. Uh, this uh, says the pure effect of, of measured productivity change, uh, raising demand, effectively, demand for uh, workers for population is a couple of percentage points, uh, generally not nearly as large as the fluctuations we observe. So now I, I think the question you know, we're all asking is, well, is this time period different, right? Has the kind of love affair uh, between productivity and, and employment, uh, have, they, have they parted ways? Uh, and so the last augmentation we do is we allow this, uh, these spillover effects and direct effects to have, to have a time uh, uh, interaction. So they differ by decade of our data. Uh, this shows you uh, the direct effects and the spillover effects. And it is interesting that the spillover effects surprisingly appear least positive in the 80s and the 2000, 2007 period. Now, 2000, 2007 is special, not in a good way. Uh, you know, that's the period leading into the Great Recession. It was a period of incredibly slow employment growth, particularly in the United States, so we don't know precisely why. These net effects are uh, significantly positive in these periods uh, and, and insignificant in the others. So it's not, uh, it's hard to make a strong inference from that about whether the current period is different from earlier periods. However, I will say, if you do this using value added based productivity growth as opposed to pure labor productivity growth, you do see what looks like a secular downward trend, less net positive effect of productivity growth. And, uh, and in the 2000s, uh, weakly negative, but not significant. So if you wanted to go for the kind of uh, fear-mongering interpretation, uh, you would say that uh, things, you know, it used to be in the good old days, you know, productivity meant something, uh, but nowadays it just means more people out of work. Um, I think we think that conclusion is pr premature. Uh, I think when we have additional data through 2014 uh, for the Brookings paper, we'll have a, a firmer toehold on this question. Um, so let me, in the last, I just can take two more minutes. Um, this presents at least a, a moder modestly encouraging or not terrifying picture of employment consequences of productivity growth. Um, but the other component you might be concerned about is not just the number of jobs, but jobs for whom. Um, Productivity growth might shift skill demand in two ways. One is it might be skill biased, right? That where you see productivity growing, you see shifts towards more educated workers, for example. The other could be that it could be sector biased, that advancing sectors, if uh, are we know from our, from our evidence from Baumol, that those will tend to shrink, uh, and uh, lagging sectors will tend to grow if the advancing sectors are more labor intensive and the expanding sectors are more skill intensive, then that productivity growth, growth will be non-neutral for overall labor demand. Um, it turns out that the first channel, the skill bias of productivity growth, we see no evidence of that. It's not the case that sectors are having uh, relatively faster labor productivity growth are then substituting more heavily towards more middle skill workers, or middle or high or low skill workers. I should say, measurement of skill groups cross nationally and trying to make them comparable is an imperfect uh, science. It's not a science, uh, not a science. Uh, so, <laughs> You can laugh again, uh, and, uh, <laughs> but uh, as best we can tell. However, the sector bias is quite important. Um, it is the case uh, that a lot of the productivity growth, particularly in manufacturing and in primary sectors, uh, has had the effect of reducing employment in those areas. So uh, even ma maintaining full uh, total count of jobs, they're going to be moving into sectors that are generally more skill intensive, or those are where the remaining openings will be. And so our, looking across all our countries, uh, we, it, it appears that this, the net effect of productivity growth has been relatively strongly skill biased, that uh, the, the, the uh, implied changes in demand for high skill workers are substantially larger than for either medium or low skill. Now, it varies somewhat across countries when we do this exercise. The US stands out for having uh, very um, polarized skill demand, where high and low demands are growing faster than the middle, but it varies across countries. Um, so we don't, we don't draw too firm, too strong inference from that. So to conclude, um, is productivity growth threatening employment? Are we, are we in the robocalypse now? Uh, not so far. Uh, as far as we can see, at least, again, all data analysis is, is retrospective. 
Uh, what we see in this period is that employment shrinks in advancing sectors, uh, but spillovers offset that in lagging sectors. Uh, the net effect is productivity growth modestly contributes to rising employment uh, as well as rising consumption. Um, this vir virtuous relationship may have weakened, so we may be approaching robocalypse later as opposed to now. Um, the distribution of productivity growth across sectors does matter. Um, we estimate that productivity growth in services, especially low skill services, produces the largest positive spillover. So if you think that robots are coming into fast food restaurants, into healthcare and so on, uh, if you uh, take these numbers seriously, um, then you should think that's good news, right? That that's gonna create, it's obviously gonna raise real income substantially, and maybe it'll have other positive effects on employment through these uh, demand channels. Um, the, uh, even if you accept the idea that productivity growth is by and large good for overall employment, it still has non-neutral distributional impacts. Uh, the challenge will still be the quality of jobs, not the quantity, and that there may be lots of high quality jobs and lots of people who are not, of the, uh, lots of people who are not qualified for them. And that's what we see in, in many advanced economies, right? All of us and many of the people we know are overemployed, but we know we have an underemployment problem uh, broadly. And then uh, I should just say, we, uh, in future work on this topic, we're going to look uh, at later data. We're gonna be looking at the hours margin as well as the employment margin. Uh, and as Chris Priscerides emphasized to us, that we could find a very different response in terms of you know, uh, some of this in terms of leisure, more jobs at fewer hours. Um, and uh, we'll be digging deeper into the spillovers, including the cross-national spillovers. So uh, uh, thank you uh, very much, and I look forward to the comments um, from Betsy Stevenson. Thank you. It is a, a real pleasure uh, to be here and to have gotten a chance to read David and Anna's um, really uh, amazing paper and to just spend an entire day thinking about on the ground and in the air, robots, robots everywhere. <laughs> um, and uh, I wanted to start by saying, uh, you know, we have one view about what's coming with robots, but our children are being prepared with another view. So this is a recent children's book and they seem quite excited about the fact that there's gonna be robots, robots everywhere. Certainly my children don't see this as a dystopian thing. They uh, see it as an exciting thing. So uh, we've had a lot of discussion about what's gonna happen to employment and the issue with employment and income distribution. And so I think what I'm gonna try to do is summarize some of what we've talked about because there's not a lot new left to say. But the great thing is we're ending on a paper where we have something new, which is empirical evidence uh, that we're bringing to bear on this question of what's happened to employment in the, in the past. And, um, and so they've done a really great job of, of marshalling a lot of evidence to discuss this question of what happens to employment when technologic, technological change has occurred. Now economists think that we know the answer, and in, in fact, David think, thought he knew the answer before he started this paper, um, and we can see this by going back to a 2014 question in the IGA in which people are asked, um, has automation led to more employment in the past? Just point blank, I think it's a great question. Advancing automation has not historically reduced employment in the United States, and roughly 80 to 90 percent of economists agree with this, either strongly agree or agree that advancing automation has not historically reduced employment in the United States. And they, uh, you know, they agree with it for a bunch of different reasons. So I'll, I'll, of course, tell you David's answer since we're discussing his paper. And he points to a potential disruption, but then in the long run, no, and says, you know, some of the evidence he's using is simply the fact that labor force participation has risen throughout most of the 20th century. Now, I pulled out three other comments because they sort of illustrate three points that I'd like to, to make. Um, so Nancy Stokey says, if this had been true over the last two centuries, almost no one would be working anymore. So when you take a really long run view, it it's has to be true that automation has not reduced uh, employment, at least not at as rapid a pace as the automation has uh, itself occurred. Uh, Ken Judd says, why do we care? Like productivity increases options, employment becomes more beneficial, but it's irrelevant if people choose to work less. So thinking about this issue of choice and what do people choose to do, and then Oliver Hart points to the temporary displacement, uh, but then says displaced workers eventually find jobs elsewhere, uh, as theory might predict. So all these people agree that automation has not reduced employment. So I wanna start by suggesting that we think about short run versus long run effects. And uh, I, th I think when most of us think about AI, we're really trying to think about what the long run future holds. 
Um, and our intuition comes from looking at how growth has changed our lives. And it's not from how it's changed our lives over the last five years, but you know, looking, you know, look at this room, we're all sitting around spending our time thinking about ideas, but if we look 10 generations back in our own family, I bet a lot of you would find family members who were farming, because that's what most people did, uh, or uh, doing something else that was not sitting around thinking about ideas. Um, but this paper uses more high frequency variation in productivity to see what happens in the short run when productivity changes. And I think there's a real question as to whether what we can take from short run variation in productivity to make inferences about what will happen in the long run uh, when we have you know, massive disruptive technologies. Are they really the same thing? And does what cause productivity to go up and down from year to year and across country, uh, is that different from say a big technological shift uh, that has a permanent change that will eventually at least percolate throughout the, the world. Um, there is something that, that we learned that I think points us in a direction to think, which is that he, the impacts on own and other industry employment vary over time, or at least suggestively. It's hard to tell with the standard errors for sure, but seem to vary over time and vary by industry and vary by industry and by time. And so maybe this means that different advances have different effects. And the source of the variation they're using really matters to know whether this is informative about the future. So what is causing the productivity to, to change in a way that's correlated with changing employment? And do we understand that source of variation? And can we then use it to say anything predictive about my, what might happen in the future? So, you know, I started by saying most economists think automation has not reduced uh, employment, but yet actually our intuition's a little bit wrong because work has declined when we think about it in terms of the number of the share of our life in terms of hours and days that we're gonna spend working. People used to work a lot. Um, one of the things I, I learned when I was in Australia this year is Britain used to treat you when you were seven years old as an adult. You could be sentenced for a crime at age seven as an adult and sent to Australia. That's why I learned it in Australia. Um, uh, that was one of the, you know, the way they treated prisoners. So we had a really different uh, view towards youth, and now we have extended youth. And now you're 23 and you're still a child, and what we see is decreasing work um, that it, by children, including college-age children, and this has been partially facilitated by child labor laws. So I do want to, there's this interaction with these changes in work with government policies. We have extended retirement, which is also partially facilitated by government retirement policies, and we have a decline in hours work. So here we have a decline in employment, and it's sort of the Ken Judd point. These are actually thought to be improvements in living standards, not something we're sad about. I'm not trying to get my kids back into the workforce. But, uh, I'm glad they're going to look at hours. I think hours are really important, and this is what uh, you can see over the time period. They're looking at 1970 to 2017 um, is annual hours worked, and all of the relevant countries that we're talking about have declined, pro the least in the United States. That's what makes us a little bit of an odd duck, quite a bit in Japan. Um, and uh, the United Kingdom and Germany as well. So uh, is, it, is employment the right margin or is the right margin the amount of work you're doing? So this brings me uh, to the point of why do people work for pay? And there's a trade-off they make between leisure, home-produced goods, and market-produced goods. This actually kind of matters from a measurement perspective because the 1970s was a period of very rapid substitution of non-market produced goods going away and in their place being substituted by market produced goods. So women stopped making clothes and making pies from scratch and cakes from scratch and started going to work and buying clothes and buying pies and buying cake mixes. So technological change occurred in a way that crowded out uh, homemade goods and crowded in women's labor force participation. But should we think about this as did it increase or decrease work? We actually have to really look at time use surveys to understand that. They certainly shifted from outside our measurement scope to inside it. I would argue there are fewer child care workers today than 40 years ago if you count every stay at home mom as a child care worker. Um, but if we look at time use surveys, dads are actually working more even though they're working less in the labor force. 
once we put in hours spent on childcare, hours spent on housework, guys are really have it tough these days, right? They're working a bit harder than they did in the, in the 1960s. So it just, you know, if we want to think about really measuring what happens to work, we might want a more holistic sense of what work is. So uh, I, I want to make just a brief comment about the idea of disruption. And this survey that just came out that uh, was already mentioned, and here what we see is most economists actually think they're going to be people who are hurt uh, through longer spells of unemployment, and, and David's in the minority here, but I think this is kind of a weird question because unemployment's like a disequilibrium thing, so maybe unemployment doesn't happen, but that maybe people drop out of the labor force. But what you see is there's definitely belief that some people are going to get hurt here, um, so that you know even if there isn't a shortage of jobs, there's perhaps... Uh, from the author's findings is that even if there isn't a shortage of jobs, there might be jobs that workers don't want or aren't qualified to do, and that, that's really important. So the last thing I, I want to end on is the authors find that population growth leads to more jobs. So aren't robots just another form of population growth? I mean, I already heard from Danny Kahneman they're going to be just like me but better. So if the babies, that's how I, when I look at my children, they're just like me but better. I don't fear them taking my jobs, so why should I fear the robots taking my jobs if I don't fear the babies taking my jobs? Well, I think this really depends on how we think about the world. From the world's perspective, if robots can do everything, there's nothing left for workers to do, and we get to consume everything the robots make. If you're a small open economy, robots can raise national income and may continue to raise employment, and so there is this national competition issue that we haven't really talked that much about, which is who gets the robots and how do their industries succeed. And that does bring me a little bit back to the point that I worry about the where that variation is coming from when it comes to cross-national data. Um, but in the end, I think the thing we've all agreed on today is there's really two separate questions. There's an employment question, in which the fundamental question is, can we find fulfilling ways to spend our time if robots take our jobs? And an income question, can we find a stable and fair distribution of income? And um, I've always loved this quote from David Otter, uh, which is from 2015. I loved it so much, I actually sent it to President Obama back when I was in the White House. Um, if we automate all the jobs, we'll be rich, which means we have a distribution problem, not an income problem. So I think you know, that's already been talked about, but these, I think we really should think about these as separate questions, which is how do we stratify society, or, or set up society, I should say, in a way in which we can help people find fulfilling ways to spend their time, which is separate from can we find a stable and fair distribution of income. I'm really confident we can find a way to be fulfilled. I'm less confident that we can solve the political economy problem of redistribution. Thank you. Okay, uh, comments or questions? We'll start with Chad and then Hal. It's a little awkward talking to the microphone when you're next to me, but uh, do you have to worry about division bias in the within industry estimates? You got employment on the left side the, and then in the denominator on the right-hand side. I don't doubt the point estimate's negative, but it might be not as negative as you're finding. Uh, and then it would be interesting uh, as a test of the mechanism to see if the size of the within industry effect varies with estimates of the demand elasticity for that sector's product, going, getting at uh, Jim's, some of Jim's work. So you can just take those off the shelf. You'll probably find them for each sector. And then just see whether you have larger negative employment effects with less elastic demand, I think would be the implication. OK, Hal, and then Dan. So. Uh, I like Betsy's uh, conundrum there. The way I phrase it sometimes, say everybody wants more jobs and less work. That's the goal, right? The uh, <laughs> second point I want to make is about demography because uh, that's a really critical issue here. If you look at the U.S., right now the labor force is growing at half the rate the population is growing during the next decade from the 2020 to 2030. It'll grow at the lowest rate ever. This is because the two big forces that uh, David mentioned, one is uh, uh, women entering the labor force and the baby boomers, that's played out. And many economists who look at this closely think that we will see uh, very tight labor markets for the next 25 years. 
And we're in good shape compared to the rest of the world because if you look at China, Japan, South Korea, Italy, Germany, they're in terrible situation with respect to the demographic bust. Uh, so if we don't get more productivity from the, from the AIs and from the robots, uh, we're in really big trouble. Okay, Dan, uh, followed by Avi. regression you show us to it in long changes. I understand that it reduces your limit, your ability to look at linkages, but th as it is the first, that should be the first regression. The other thing is I was puzzling over why you would get different results for different measures, and it struck me that the, the answer is this literature on the offshoring bias in manufacturing. That gross output has material inputs in it, and that's working off of a different price index because of offshoring. And we know that that has, that price index problem has major implications for uh, how we think about the size of manufacturing. Okay, I think uh, we've talked a lot about skills and skill bias. I think it's important to think about whether skill bias is a statement about skills or people. Are all skills being automated, but only low skill workers are unable to adapt? Or are only low skill jobs being automated? And I'm thinking about spreadsheets and accountants in the background of this question. Okay, uh, Anton, followed by Eric. So in some sense, your results beautifully confirm our models of heterogeneous sectors with sufficient complementarity, right? Um, now, what I found interesting, you analyzed this question from the demand for labor side, uh, but if we think of a world where labor supply for most people is pretty inelastic, or let's say job uh, supply, uh, then it would suggest that you could also look at the supply side and, for example, study how sectoral productivity changes affect unemployment or leaving of the labor force by last occupation and last sector. And that may be quite helpful as a complementary result. So really interesting, useful results should be a starting point for most of the discussions here. Um, my question has to do about how identified this relationship is. I, I was surprised how causal your language was in the presentation, to some extent in the, in the paper. Uh, yeah, and, and maybe you could say a little bit, I know you had some IV results in, in the paper, but you know, I, I'm not sure you were that confident of them. And, and um, you know, there are lots of reasons that these um, uh, variables may co-vary, that the other things might be driving them. And, and maybe you could say a little bit about how we should interpret these correlations. Okay, David, would you like to address some of these? Uh, yeah, okay. Um, do you want to start? Uh, I can take the first yeah. one and leave the rest of the time. Okay. Great. So thank you very much for those great comments and everyone's questions. So I think the sort of issue about hours versus jobs, as, as Hal put it, uh, we want, we, what would you say, we want more jobs, less less work. I think that those are two interesting margins, but I, I think most of the discussion is about, like, are people still going to have jobs? And if you think about the hours discussion, you could sort of frame that more from a lo labor supply perspective, right? Income effects, possibly dominating substitution effects sort of in the very long run. Also, the picture you showed from, like, 1970, I think also historically, Looking at Joel, <laughs> uh, uh, like the work week was reduced by like 20 to 30 hours on average, I think, across like a bunch of uh, developed countries. So I think that's, you know, you know, you could see that as good news in that sense that people have a preference for working less and doing more le leisure, which, as you correctly say, could in part be home production, right? So I think, yeah, that's why we want to look at the hours. But I, I would say uh, the sort of public debate is more about the employment in the end, so uh, the jobs. So that's why we, we sort of focus on that and baseline. But um, yeah, I agree. Um, I don't know if I should take more. So in terms of the long run uh, and short run variation, so that is something that we did do. So we did start out with a sort of long difference type specifications. We should have probably put those more prominently sort of at the foreground. So that's, that's uh, very well taken. Uh, we did do the trough to trough and um, peak to peak regressions, which are f more long run to sort of avoid do dealing with the sort of business cycle, short run fluctuations for that reason. Uh, but yeah, absolutely we should do, uh, you know, put that more prominently in the results. Maybe I leave a couple to you. Okay. Uh, yeah, the points are real taken. I, I also like Chad's suggestion about looking at the demand elasticity and seeing how that, you know, that's kind of a proof of concept of, uh, if nothing else. It is absolutely the case that you could have division bias, uh, you know, your, your you know, output, uh, uh, you know, labor productivity on one side, output on the other, or excuse me, employment on the other, they both, you know, so employment's on the left side and then the denominator of the right side, so that would drive the coefficients negative. 
through measurement error. Uh, so one way that's likely attenuated is by looking at long changes, but not perfectly. We did try to instrument uh, using productivity growth in the same industries in other countries. Uh, it did not make the results, it did not make the estimates, point estimates less negative. Uh, which is the direction we thought the bias was present. And then uh, eventually as you start adding more industry year country effects, the variation becomes uh, almost meaningless at that point. So this was the best we could do, but it, we realize it's, it's not what we, we'd often like to do. Um, very much take the point about demography in the extension of the paper, we will be working, looking at age structure and you know, work by in Drone and uh, Pasquale Restrepo has argued that actually demography is one of the big drivers of robots and the countries that have a shrinking young uh, population are the ones adopting robotics most quickly and that robots arguably are complementary to older workers and substitutable for younger workers. Um, the, uh, there was one more I wanted to, uh, oh, go ahead. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it was just uh, also about the demand elasticity. So I think that that would be very interesting. And another thing that I think would also relate to the I/O discussion is that you know one thing we saw is that in manufacturing, the the sort of um, within the own effect was less negative, which could be because of sort of higher product market competition there, right? So it could be that uh, productivity increases lead to stronger price responses and therefore a stronger demand response, which would be lead to you know less strong uh, reduction in employment uh, there. And then also the question about the cross-national um, type discussion about you know who should own the robots. I think that's a very you know it goes kind of back to the distributional concerns that sort of pervaded the whole discussion. And I, you know one one thing that springs to mind there is Richard Freeman wrote this piece: "We should own the robots" when he won the Isaac A Prize, which I think kind of goes in that direction. Not only between countries, I guess, but also within countries in the end. If those are really going to be the sort of uh, whole source of this this great abundance that we're going to have, then we're going to want to own own those, uh, I guess. Very last point. Um, the question about, you know, should we be looking at hours or jobs? Well, actually, the correct answer is we'd be looking at wages, right? That's really the thing uh, you'd want to know because presumably when people are faced with a wage, then they can choose how many hours whether they want to work or not. Um, the difficulty with that from identification perspective is we think that's, you know, a national by skill thing, not an industry by, so it makes it harder to use the same type of variation or setup. But that's on the agenda because if we see people uh, have facing higher wages, doing less work, we're going to view that as a good thing. If we see uh, wages and employment declining simultaneously, we're going to tend to view that as a, a, a less uh, compelling story, a less positive story. Uh, thanks very much. Again, thanks to Betsy for uh, her comments, and thanks to all of you as well.